What are the benefits of ADHD coaching? What are some tips to help you navigate burnout? And how can your company build a more inclusive workplace for a neurodivergent workforce? These are just some of the topics we discuss in this week's episode with Leanne Maskell, who is the author of ADHD and A to Z, the founder of ADHD Works and an ADHD coach. If you find this podcast valuable, please click the follow button on whatever podcast app you listen to. Or if you're on YouTube, please click the subscribe button. It really, really helps the show. Thank you very much and enjoy the episode. Leanne, thank you so much for coming onto the show. Thank you for having me. I feel very privileged to be here. I always like to ask my guests the same question just to get some continuity. And that is, given the vast amount that you know about ADHD now, Looking back into your earlier years, what's your earliest memory of displaying ADHD traits? Um, well, you asked me this a few days ago, and that's I've written like a journal of memories <laughs> since, and I was like, oh. um, but one of, well, I think probably the earliest one is I used to basically try to trick my brain uh, into thinking things I couldn't think of, and that sounds really weird, but like, I would be like, I'm not always thinking about a vacuum cleaner. I would like try and think of random, like trick myself because I was already so overwhelmed by like overthinking and ruminating on my thoughts and like all of the thoughts. And, um, and also another one is like, I used to, we used to have an apple tree in the garden. I used to hang upside down from it like every day. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, and like, yeah. And I guess looking back now, I'm like, oh, the need for stimulation and like physical stimulation and, um, like the overthinking there. One of the favorite is free facts. <laughs> One more is that, um, <laughs> yeah, when, when I was quite young, we got broken into in the house and the police came over and they were like, they're, they're burglars, they've trashed your bedroom. It was in Cyprus, they were like, they've trashed this little girl's bedroom. And I was like, no, there. It was actually already like that. That was just your mess. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was like, actually, it was already the same. They didn't actually touch anything. They just took my pocket money from underneath my sock drawer in like very complicated yeah, yeah. arrangements. So yeah, I could think of a lot of things looking back in childhood, but I wasn't obviously diagnosed until 25 years old. So interesting journey. Thank you for the hyper focus of the weekend. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's, that's typical, isn't it? That ADHD, um, perhaps the mess and to have it confused with a potential burglary. Is um yeah no I look back into my bedroom when, when I was younger and I, yeah I think there's relatability there for sure. What do you remember what your school reports look like? No, no, <laughs> no, I don't. And the, it, during the diagnosis process, they're like, oh, we want your school reports, and I don't know, I don't have any reports. I don't know what they are, but I think in I remember at school like basically being always told off for being like not concentrating or just the kind of under the radar. And when I finished um, my GCSEs, I actually got all A's and then my A-levels and the teacher literally asked the whole class if I cheated because she was like, it's not possible that Leanne has got all A's. Um, and yeah, like the kind of narrative I grew up with, especially around school was that like I was stupid. So that's kind of what I believed about myself growing up. So you had this like, I think, you could remember facts. So then when you sat the exam, that's, you think that's why you were able to pass everything so well? Um, I could, and I can, like cram stuff into my brain. Mm. I couldn't listen at all during lessons, like in any way whatsoever. Um, but at the end of the year, because I knew I hadn't like listened to anything for the entire year, I was always doing my homework like on the way to school, trying to figure out just something to put down so it looked like I'd done it. Um, I managed, but I could teach myself really, really well. So at the end of the year, I could like cram all of that information into my brain. I can write really quickly. Um, and I just, I think I just figured out the formats for like writing exams and so I could, I could do them very well. So I kind of knew this quite early on about myself anyway, that like go for exam based subjects, don't go for like course work based subjects, which was helpful. <laughs> it was helpful how I had like kind of managed it myself from an early age, but I just thought it was because like, I could write really quickly. Mm. That's so interesting. You sort of being able to, in a way, hack the system. You sort of recognize what you can, not cheat on, but what you're really, really good at. So you can memorize stuff. You can almost take a little bit of a shortcut where other students perhaps wouldn't do. And then you got into law. How did that happen? Yeah, I studied law at school and I had a teacher that was really nice. She was like the one really nice 
teacher and me and my friend actually would sit at the front of the class and like answer all the questions. That was the only class I'd ever been like engaged in. But I think it was because I had the teacher that could see that I learned differently to most people mm. and she like accommodated that even at school. And then I just picked law because it seemed like a good subject to do, as society tells you that it is. Um, and studied it again, did the same thing, like didn't go to any lectures, managed to get a law degree by going on Wikipedia and memorizing all of the cases. So yeah, and I think I definitely graduated feeling like I had cheated. Um, mm. And I do often feel like I've cheated <laughs> like in life <laughs> and love where because society and the education system in particular says like, no, you should go to all of your lectures, you should be studying. And like, I could see my friends that were spending every day, like really getting into these like hundreds of pages of reading they've been set every week. And I was like, nah. You know, at the end of the year. and I don't think that society, <laughs> you know, the whole point of like a law degree is that you can go and study and work really hard for something, not that you can be able to pass the exam. And, and for me, that is what kind of led my life to fall apart after university because I graduated with this degree that I had no idea how to use. I could do exams, but I couldn't do like CVs, I mm. couldn't put that into practice. I had no idea how to explain to someone like what I wanted to do with my life. Um, or like what kind of law I wanted to go into already at university. Um, everyone around me was like, have you applied for this graduate scheme? And I was like, no, what is that? <laughs> what do we need to do and when? <laughs> a bit like, did it feel sort of like everyone's got a handbook for life and you perhaps maybe just missed it when yes. it was being handed out? You had like memorized how to pass all the exams, but actually when it came down to what to do in order to progress as an adult, you just didn't have that toolbox? Yeah, I still feel like that. Like, do you feel like everyone else has got a guidebook of like how to be a functional human being? And I'm yeah. like, we are winging it and it seems to be working. Okay, we're alive and functional, but like, it's quite ironic because I think other people look at that and they're like, oh, you have a law degree or written the book or whatever. And you're like, I don't know how, how I'm doing any of this stuff. And I, get, I think that is the ADHD there of like, um, we can do things we just don't always know how we've done them or like because of the impacted self-awareness so we might be able to do things and because we're not sure how we've done it or think about that before or plan it out mm. um, it makes it hard to repeat or explain to someone else which I think can lead to people feeling like um, severe imposter syndrome rejection sensitive disorder which are all things that I definitely am <laughs> feeling on the day-to-day -day basis but like um yeah, I think, but then it's fine. I think for me finding out that I had ADHD really helped me to put this into perspective and understand that I wasn't just like stupid, but pretending not to be stupid, mm. but that I was just different. The imposter syndrome is fascinating, and you mentioned it then. There's something I read about, like, they call it success amnesia, and it's quite common, I think, amongst the ADHD community where you, like you said, you do something that's, that is to everyone else really impressive. In your case, the, the books you've written, the courses that you create, but you kind of forget that you've done them. So you lose touch of that self-recognition. So then when you try to do something again, because you've forgotten that you can do it, and you've forgotten about your achievements, that's when the imposter syndrome comes in. Does that ring a bell? Yeah, <laughs> yeah it's, it's really annoying. Yeah, yeah it's really, it's so annoying because it's like um, kind of constant, like I'll do things like, a, I'll write a book and publish it. And then I'll feel actually usually even worse because of the way the dopamine works, like with the dopamine and ADHD brains that are seeking dopamine. It's like, I always use it the example of like booking a holiday in that it's more exciting booking the holiday. Mm. And then once we're on the holiday, we're like booking the next holiday. It's like the next, the next thing, the next thing. And um, the ADHD brains are particularly like prone to seeking that kind of dopamine of looking forward to something mm. and the excitement and high highs of adrenaline when you actually get it, it can be quite a crash. Mm. And you're like, what do I do now? How yeah. am I meant to do that again? I have no idea um, what, how I even did that. That was just a fluke. And now all these people are saying that I'm going to actually coach the girl once at school and she got an A and her teacher gave it out to the whole class as like an example. 
of what to do and she was so upset because she was like now everyone's going to hold me to the standard and she's like I've got no idea how I did that and I can't do it I don't want to be known as <laughs> the best in the class it's really <laughs> ironic because everyone around you is like wow you yeah, yeah. yeah and I think that's why I see so much in the people that I coach in that we have this because we're always looking towards the future any positive things we've done we can very easily discount them especially for me like the law degree I'm like I have no idea how I got that so I don't really put very much um mm. value into it maybe as much as someone that had really 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 hard even though I did work really hard I just didn't do it in the same <laughs> way um compared to like people that do collect these achievements and they really enjoy them and they've got really good they can really build their confidence because mm. I think confidence comes from doing things getting out of our comfort zone and like knowing that we're good at things because we've done them before but if you keep forgetting what you've done and you're like next goal post what what is the next thing it can be really hard to like to build that confidence in yourself so it's so relatable the imposter syndrome and actually when i found out about this like what you were talking about you forget about things you've done and i relate it to maybe if i'm talking on stage like the I always feel like I'm like useless and I can't do it and I'm dreading it for, for the, to the, to the build-up. But when I get on stage time and time again, it goes okay. It goes absolutely fine. And then I feel amazing for like a day or two afterwards. But then when I get another one in the diary, that feeling creeps back quite quickly that I don't know what I'm doing. But it's kind of like this loop. And so I suppose my question, if, if, if there's anyone listening who relates to that, is there anything, do you have any advice for someone who, who, who goes through that loop of achieving forgetting feeling like you can't achieve coaching coaching yeah. Yeah, ADHD coaching with me read my book ADHD and then yeah. <laughs> no um I think reminding yourself like I literally write it down every day I have like a little journal of like write that I try to write down every month all the things I've done that month having accountability like actually creating time in your calendar to like celebrate yourself which sounds a bit weird but um like my company ADHD Works has just had the first year and we had a whole working day together last week and then we all went out for dinner afterwards and I was like oh oh this is nice <laughs> and the cow was like it's taken me a year to be like oh I feel quite proud <laughs> um and but yeah I think like really creating these moments for yourself to actually celebrate also my friends I was talking to my friends about it and they, they very kindly threw me a surprise kind of celebration for it which is really nice of them because they know that like I'm kind of like oh next thing like actually I probably feel worse whenever I've just achieved something um but I think for people listening to it like literally writing down your wins that's why in the coaching we always start out with like a win um mm. in the session to of like a win of the week something good that's gone on because we can just forget <laughs> we forget so easily and so much happens in the week and then in coaching as well it's all about um looking at what has worked for you previously and like really like making that designed pause for you to actually reflect on like why you're doing what you're doing mm. <laughs> how are you going to do it and then like actually enjoy it afterwards and like okay um building that confidence up in yourself and i think mean, just being nice to yourself oh I, or like in my worst days of mental health in general like i literally wrote myself a letter every morning which was quite helpful of being like you are not a failure i would recommend it if you're feeling this way and being like actually you've, you've done all these hard things but like yourself and they were you said about um feeling the anxiety for talks i think it's just noticing when it starts to happen and then mm. literally talking back to your brain and reminding yourself like oh, i did a talk last week and that actually went okay and like having that list of proof there and challenging your thoughts mm. i think it's really good advice thanks you said you do you, you got diagnosed at 25 yeah so i suppose what happened in the lead up to that and and why why did adhd come into your sphere of conscience um i found out that i had adhd only at the diagnosis time i after i graduated from university i mentioned that i had this basically a huge crash where i didn't have any structure to my life i was modeling like fashion modeling but i really didn't want to be at all uh, so I kept like trying to get different jobs in any any job I would have taken literally anything <laughs> for a week and then I would have quit it a week later which is what I did um repeatedly and I was like oh my god what's happening to my life and this led to like more erratic decisions I just broke up with someone I was in a relationship with for five years 
started like going out drinking every night to try and be hungover to relax the next day because with modeling you find out what you're doing every day the night before at six o'clock so every day it's like playing the lottery it's not very mm. good for your ADHD brain because like um you know that email at six o'clock could be like tomorrow you're going to China yeah it sounds stressful tomorrow you have won <laughs> 10,000 pounds to having a photo taken but most of the time it was nothing or tomorrow you've got to go to like the middle of nowhere and stand in the line of people that look mm. like you but much better and be rejected to your face and called ugly so like <laughs> wasn't a great life and um yeah and then after after living like that for a couple of years my life was just spiraling I started moving country um, going anywhere like if I had a problem I would just start over again like the new jobs became like new countries and then I ended up feeling very suicidal I was like I just need to turn my brain off I would have definitely killed myself if I had a button that would have like if I was allergic to peanuts I would have definitely eaten the peanut but unfortunately I was like, <laughs> for, or fortunately fortunately I've got ADHD so I procrastinated on this and I'm still here but like that really consumed my life every day <laughs> yeah i always say like in corporate talks now they're, they're like what did she just say? <laughs> um, and i'm like no one ever laughs at this joke and then they all start laughing but um but yeah it, it was really bad like every day i would was like really obsessed with trying to figure out how to 100 percent ensure that i would not be alive if i did try to kill myself because i was like that would be much worse so eventually um i had kind of decided to do that i think i figured out a plan i was like this day i need to clean my house first i need to like not you know and then um but that week that i had like kind of my last week was such an amazing mm. time because i just stopped worrying about what i was doing with my life i stopped stressing out about like like i just just like, i'll eat two chocolate croissants because i want to mm. i will go for a walk by the beach because i'll i'm gonna die next week so it'll be nice to see the ocean Gosh. <laughs> um, but it, and it's and I would not recommend that as a strategy for like mm. mindfulness, but it did work. And I realized that I was actually like happy for the first time. I wasn't living with this like overwhelming, crushing anxiety. Made me realize that maybe life could be like that. I decided to go and get like proper help because I've been to see doctors a few times in the lead up. And they were all like, you're fine. And I was like, okay, <laughs> if you say so. And I was like, I'm not fine. Oh, um, but the, yeah. And so I went to see like a proper psychiatrist in London who and I'd started googling the feelings I was experiencing and came up with a list of like 10 conditions including borderline personality disorder and bipolar and depression and anxiety and presented my list to the psychiatrist he was like no you don't have any of this you have got ADHD mm. I was like no I've got a real problem he was like yeah you've got really bad ADHD I was like well fine actually that's not so I genuinely believe that I would be put into hospital if I told anyone like what was going on in my brain so I was like fine that's not actually that bad give me your, give me your drugs <laughs> he's like no we can't do that yeah. either you have to come back and pay another 400 pounds but I was going on holiday the next day so I said I'll come back after my two-week holiday um and then he's like yep yeah, cool I went holiday and I moved in with someone that I met on the beach and did a partner visa with them for eight thousand <laughs> pounds impulsive yes <laughs> <laughs> and then a year later I came back to see him and was like I believe you ADHD is real. Okay, <laughs> I will take your diagnosis now. But it, and that's yeah. really what led me to kind of write that book and stuff because during that year it did enable me to sink in and like I actually learned about things like rejection sensitive dysphoria, which made me accept the diagnosis because mm. when I was first diagnosed, I was like, that's not why I have. I have a law degree. Like I can concentrate. I'm, I was always trying to skip PE at school. I wasn't like a hyperactive kid. Um, but like learning about it myself enabled me to like actually understand okay this is what we're dealing with so that's gosh that's a real a <laughs> i read journey. on your linkedin i think you said before that you got diagnosed you felt like you were swimming in an ocean and everyone else was swimming the other way and then you got diagnosed and now you're you're a three times best-selling author you have this huge company training coaches so you, the before and after is mega yeah and uh, do you feel like a lot more in control that you have this understanding now yeah i feel like my life literally started at 25 like i can't express when i do talks and stuff like you just said now people it sounds very impressive and i always find it quite amazing because like until i was 25 i literally lived every day like wanting to kill myself and mm. like i can't even remember much of those years because i was so like 
my head was like in the clouds for so long and I was it's so so um sad all the time and then I think for me it was getting the diagnosis and like being able to get a job and keep that job for like two and a half years I did move over the road from the job to keep it I was like I know that I someone has confirmed to me that I do quit jobs now <laughs> so it's not just in my head so I'm gonna live over the road from them mm. on chancery lane <laughs> and it worked until the pandemic um but no, and so, so I kind of knew what I was working with, which enabled me to plan like that. And I think at first I tried to really force myself into like a box and be like, huh, got the keys to be normal, take the tablets, I'm good. But then over time, the more I understood it, the more I was mm. like, oh, maybe actually like, I don't want to be normal. <laughs> it's like maybe, maybe being normal is kind of overrated. Yeah. And actually maybe I should <laughs> quit my job and go and be an ADHD coach. And uh, yeah, because I was still struggling, even though like I was, in the kind of box and I was like yes we're good I've got a job I was so happy to get every day I was going to work like oh, good morning everyone <laughs> um yeah but the yeah so I think the difference is quite astronomical and also like you know there's so much stigma out there about ADHD being real medication etc but mm. the the only things that I know to be true is that like before I was diagnosed with ADHD before I took ADHD medication before I understood like how my brain worked is that I if I had a problem, my brain would like um, speed to shut down mode, like in becoming very suicidal and not in the way of like um, long periods, but just the very short periods of time, but like it was extremely dangerous. And that's why one in four women have actually attempted suicide with ADHD. Mm. And now it, that doesn't happen. So I'm like that, that is all I need to know. We're still here, well, regardless of the books or the, whatever it is, but um, above anything else, like I know that like my life, like the way that my life is, my, the way my brain works is completely, completely different to how it was um, five years ago, so. That's an amazing turnaround. And it's such a inspiring story for other, especially women to hear because you, when you don't know how your brain works and you don't know why you're struggling in certain situations and then you get this awareness and you're like, oh, there's a reason. Mm. There's a reason why I struggle in that thing that everyone else seems to be able to do. But you get that shame, you get that feeling of, and then you get that explanation. After people get diagnosed, does that statistic, which is horrendous, does that st statistic get any better? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that much research. I know that the, there's a five times higher risk of suicide for people with ADHD in general. Mm. And, and I think... It, for me, it was learning about this like executive functioning impact of ADHD because mm. we have a 30% developmental delay. Of, and I like to think of it like a watercolor of skills. So it's like self-awareness, what we talked about, like, and the memory of like even remembering the things that you've done and who you are and the organization there and the impulsivity and the motivation and the emotional regulation. So I'm like, oh, that's why if you imagine this watercolor painting, if you're experiencing that emotional regulation challenge, it can like kick off the impulsivity, which is like, quit the job, end mm. the life, go. And then crash, and it all kind of interlink with each other. And um, and yeah, I think it's it's really difficult. And whenever I'm working with people and coaching people as well, it's, it's always like the validation of like, oh, I'm not broken. And like, I finally understand what is wrong with me because I think so many people live in similar, you, you can tell us, um, you know, it's like understanding like, oh, there is some, someone out there is saying that there is something different about my brain after living your entire life thinking like there's something wrong with you, but everyone around you being like, no, you're fine. You're like, okay, then. Well, being like, mm -hmm. no, you're just lazy. You're just not trying hard enough. And you're like, okay, I'll just try harder. But you feel like you're already trying like as hard as you possibly can to just literally be normal. That's so fascinating. Do you think that's partly what motivates you to do a lot of the amazing work you're doing now around raising awareness and advocating for neurodiversity in, in business and, and how businesses should be accommodating to neurodivergence. Yeah, I think it's lots of accidental dots that have joined up. Um, firstly, I wrote this book. Yeah. You, you can <laughs> have it. ADHD it was in my bag and has been battered by my bag, but um, in true... Style, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but buy the book. It's great. <laughs> Thank you. You don't. Okay. I make like ten p off that book. So okay. <laughs> buy my next book that will be self-published. So love you, Jeff. Love you, publishers. Um, but no, the publishers did do a really good job in like making it really 
readable I've got an audiobook for a bit before then I, I basically um yeah the whole time <laughs> Just doing my bit. <laughs> now, now <laughs> I'm like, oh, the, the, the 10 um, add up. <laughs> but the, um, yeah, I wrote that book after. So I went to my doctor and I changed doctor eventually. And they said, oh, we can continue prescribing you this medication that you're taking. But you will need to, if you want to change it, you'll need to join our waiting list for an NHS assessment, which is seven years long. I was like, what did you say like seven years <laughs> and I was like that wouldn't be a lot like what that can't be a real thing I was like people can't be waiting seven years to even get medication mm. but like to find out they have ADHD I was like I was extremely lucky that I was going to kill myself so I didn't really mind spending the money for the diagnosis because I was, mainly I was like I want to finish writing this this other book that and I was like and then and it, that was a long a long kind of story but I was really privileged to be able to afford the diagnosis in the first place um, which a lot of people aren't, and and I was like, so, and they're like, yeah, that's just how long our waiting list is. And, I was like, and you, you went private because you were in a real point of crisis, right? Yeah, yeah. but I also didn't have a GP, so right. <laughs> <laughs> and I've gone to one because I, I was that bad. I didn't mm. even have like a GP to go to, and even if I did, I would have no idea how to even go to them. I, I did. I went to a few GPs in Australia or and one in England. Um, I went to a therapist, I remember going to a therapist and being like, I have hit rock bottom. And then being like, this is what's going on in my brain. And she was like, I was like, tell me what's wrong with me. And she was like, we can't do that. We can just listen. And I was like, well then why, what is the point of me coming here? Well, I can go and talk to a lamppost. Um, and she was like, okay. <laughs> she was like, you should carry on going to therapy. Mm -hmm. um, but the, yeah. And so I went um, private and also the GP type doctors I went to see in Australia where I was like, hello, I feel like maybe my life is a bit bad. They're just like, no, you're fine. You've got a law degree. Maybe you've just got like emotional issues, but they're like, you can do anything you want. And I was like, I know, that's the problem. <laughs> like, um, yeah, so, and well, for them, my doctor telling me this, I just went back to like my job that I've managed to get as a result of being diagnosed. And I just started writing that book and finished it a month later. <laughs> and it was like, because uh, I was like, okay, well, if, if at least if I can share my experiences, so it's not great, but when I was diagnosed, there wasn't very much out there on the internet. It was just the NHS. No, uh, no one talking about ADHD on LinkedIn of all places. Mm. <laughs> uh, it was only five years ago, but no, no ADHD coaches on LinkedIn. What a brave thing to do to be the first to say ADHD on, on a professional platform. That was terrifying. <laughs> um, but I didn't have much choice again because I quit my job. So I was mm. like, I have no dignity left to lose. But I literally felt like being like, I'm a clown. Bye. <laughs> But now it's cool. But yeah, when I um, did that book, I, I wasn't really, I kind of wrote it and was like, this can help people. And then when I met people in the future, like I have, uh, there are a few people that I um, sent the manuscript to who kind of mentioned that they were struggling. And I was like, oh, I've got this book, if it helps. And they um, said how incredibly helpful that was for them, how it had like changed their life. And they said, you should really publish this. And I was like, oh, I don't really feel like destroying my life, but you know, <laughs> glad mm. it helped you. And then I had ADHD coaching. I found out from um, that you could get this paid for by the government if from access to work. And having ADHD coaching was like obviously a huge turning point for me because it was meeting someone else. I could never met anyone else with a brain like mine. All of the kind of therapy support, et cetera, I'd looked for didn't really help me, like I mentioned, <laughs> woman. Um, so yeah and and having a coach was incredibly helpful and also they ask you at the end like what you know they, it's all about actions and like moving forward so she was like what do you want to do ne by next time we talk and I was like oh like my I was like I knew too and I, was like, I didn't know what to say so I was like I, I should publish a book I've got an ADHD on my computer that I wrote eight months ago and she was like okay <laughs> and then that triggered the hyper focus <laughs> and here it is um, yeah. and then yeah and then I figured out how to like self-publish it and, and that yeah and that spiraled off like mm. I kind of I literally misspelled the title of it at first as well as AHD, which was in a very embarrassing moment. I cried in bed for three weeks. I was like, I'll never tell anyone about it and it'll be You misspelled out. the name the letters in the wrong order. Yeah. Oh, okay, classic. AHD. <laughs> I only saw it after I after I put it on the internet and I was yeah. like like you said, it was very brave. I was kinda like, Okay, I'll put it up there. And then I saw all these people liking it and stuff, and then I was like, Oh my god. 
the cover of the HD, you know what I'm saying? And like deleted the picture, yeah. was like crying, I sent the photo to everyone, I was like, look at how, like, how stupid I am, I'm gonna get canceled, and no, obviously no one else even noticed. Yeah. My it's dad, a great story. Yeah, my dad was like, that would be <laughs> worth a lot of money one day, these copies, yeah, yeah. and I was like, no. Um, but, and then I didn't talk about it for like a few months, but people started finding it on Amazon, saying how much it helped them. And then um, this woman messaged me from Microsoft and she was like, I want you to come and do a talk at Microsoft. My, my dad was like, that is a hoax. He was like, do not reply to her. Don't send her your bank details. And I was like, no, I, I sent it to my um, old model agent. <laughs> I, like, uh, I think I happened to be talking to her and I was like, this woman messaged me, do you want to help? And she said, how much do you want to charge? And I was like, a hundred. I was like, uh, I was like, I can't charge her anything. I was like, they are literally not going to pay me to do that. Like already, I think it's probably a joke. And I was like, and she was like, no, no, I think they'll pay you. And I was like, hundred pounds. And then she was like, <laughs> no, they've agreed to pay one and a half thousand and buy fifty books. And I was just was like, uh, imposter syndrome <gasps> kicking in. The- <laughs> yeah, but and I think for me there was that moment, and then also just seeing how how much the book helped people and how mm. like how doing things like that was helping people in, at work, like struggling in similar mm. situations to be able to like turn that into a job. And like also I worked in mental health and disability law. So I was seeing mm. employers really struggle with this concept of like accommodations and reasonable adjustments, like invisible disabilities. So I think it's a combination Sorry from the very long answer. No, it's fascinating. I mean, you, you touched upon the nice topic nicely, like neurodiversity and ADHD at work and how companies can better accommodate and create a inclusive culture. How do you think, if, if there's a, someone listening who has a company and understands about neurodiversity but just doesn't know what the first step is for them to be more inclusive, what would you say to someone like that? I think it's understanding why you want to be inclusive and like what, you know, for each individual that would be quite unique. I'm trying to write a book right now about called ADHD Works at mm. Work, which is for people in that position um i think it's quite a bizarre situation to be in because when i wrote that book no one was talking about adhd particularly not at work um and now (laughs) especially since setting up adhd works like i am more amazed than anybody at the companies that want help with it and for good reason because like not only are there like huge huge benefits to obviously like supporting your employees and giving them the environments where they can do things like can use that energy in like amazing ways and being inclusive i talked to this woman this morning who was like from google she made like a strategy document of how she had she is so clever she said that um we do exactly she was like we do our work but we Mm. don't know how we do our work and so she said she just wrote down how she did her work um, in a document and then sent it to people and everyone was saying how helpful that was like across the whole company because they had never had and it's like actually that helps everybody it's not just the person with ADHD but like w- when we train people up in companies no one sits down and actually explains like how to do your job mm. to you or like each task um, so I think it's looking at the different perspectives of, of what you want to be inclusive around like why like you know and because a lot of employers I work with, they're like, we want to talk about the superpowers of ADHD and like it's cool and trendy and neurodiversity awareness, D&I. We guess it is, <laughs> it's good to continue hiring, but it also is like that other angle of um, a disability. Maybe you need to accommodate that. The, the, the topic of like disclosing, so you get a ADHD or any diagnosis and then we know that companies have a legal obligation to put accommodations in place, but it's not always as black and white as that because obviously there's stigma. Um, and I hear horror stories of people going, oh, I've got ADHD now, you have to uh, allow me to come into work or whatever, accommodations. And then they get managed out of the business. They get essentially fired with no way to prove that it's because of what they said, but it obviously is. Um, so do you think that's like, you should trust your intuition if you are someone who has a recent diagnosis, you probably know with your just your gut feeling, like whether your company is going to be a safe space for you to disclose that diagnosis, do you think you should trust that intuition? I think it depends on the situation and the person. And I think once you do tell them, you can't take it back. Mm. Um, 
that is why not to do a sales pitch, but I created ADHD champions uh, <laughs> for Disney because they basically started covering neurodiversity assessments, which meant that it was their insurance. I uh, said, what are you going to do when all of these people come to you with ADHD? Mm. Diagnosis is they're like, oh, we hadn't thought about that. They're like, do, do we have to do something? And um, so I made them this program where basically we trained them up like all of their mental health first aiders in ADHD coaching skills, which basically means to have a kind of conversation, a collaborative conversation with like an ADHD lens where you know you're not going to tell someone what to do. You're not going to be like, have you tried time management? Like, yes, go <laughs> tell your manager. It's going to be great. Go for it. But like train them up in like the understandings, mm. like to actually help someone through the challenges and gave them all like a little logo so that you can talk to them. I think um, it's an individual situation and I would try to find someone similar to this, like similar, I would suggest knowing why you want to tell your employer, mm. like what you want to get out of it. Um, because yeah, like, it, and for the individual, it feels like the biggest thing in the world. It feels like you're being like, hello, I'm actually a wizard. Like, do you, are you going to fire me? <laughs> I look forward to hearing mm. back from you. And it can be really hard to, to remember that actually the employer, they're just, a, they're not, it's not personal. It's, um, they're like, okay, put it, that huge, mm. deep piece of your soul, we'll put it into our factory of like bureaucracy. Like it's, uh, how, can we give this person the interview questions in advance? No, why not? It might not be fair to other people. No, just say no. But like, I think the employees are having to really change and they are realizing that they're having to really change because, um, then people and particularly people with ADHD who are very very um strong on the social justice front were very strong I was listening to the podcast that you did with Peru he went to the tr employment tribunal like I've coached many people who are like no it's the principle I need to you know quit my job and take them to the tribunal to prove that to help other people and to like it's even though it will maybe destroy their life in the process they're mm. like no, especially because we don't think that much about the future. We're like, no, <laughs> I need to stand up for the rights of everyone. It's not fair. And the employers are just like, mm. like it's just a big wall. But they are actually experiencing a lot of struggles with this, like um, because the employment tribunal cases relating to discrimination, disability discrimination, one of which kinds is the failure to make reasonable adjustments, mm. um, have gone up by 30% in relation to like neurodivergent conditions in a year. So like, and the, also the award for it, like the damages is uncapped. So basically that means like, if you go and take your employer to court, like they could have to pay you a huge amount of money. Mm. Would highly not recommend anyone do this because it's a hugely stressful bureaucratic process. But, um, but I think employers like shouldn't have to go down that route, but they should hopefully want to like include people and get the value out of them. So sorry, that was a complete tangent to your question. You I know, it was perfect and i'm thinking if there's like a what what can companies do to make it clear to their staff that they are inclusive and i mean like for example right at the beginning when people are putting out their job adverts like the language they use and for example i mean if i was looking at a job and i saw it said like uh you know great communicator required i might then think that's quite a broad stroke skill requirement. I, because I'm a, quite a literal thinker, I don't know what that means. I'm great at emailing, but I'm not so great in a meeting. Mm. So what do you mean by a great communicator? So you're using very specific like, language just in the job advert. So that's like an example of something I think companies can do right from the very first bit of contact that someone's going to have with them when they see that job advert. So I suppose... What else can companies do to make it clear to their new staff or existing staff that it is a safe place and if they do disclose that they will be accommodated? They won't be fired. Yeah. <laughs> and they do what we do. We like you. We, yeah. We're <laughs> inclusive. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea. Um, and that's pretty much the book. So basically having that reasonable adjustments policy that I mentioned like publicly available on your website is a really good start because most employers at the beginning they will have um like a box that says do you have a disability maybe it'll say we welcome people first of all you might not even know that you have a disability mm. you might be on a seven-year waiting list for adhd for example like 
Yeah, and it's the practical realities that you mentioned there, not like they're like, like yes, that is me. I, I have a disability. And then it's like, what do you need to interview? And you're like, I don't know. Mm. <laughs> or like, you don't know what's going to happen next as soon as you say that. And so I think for employers to actually make this available on the internet, like those processes that will be followed, actually follow them, have training in place, um, share best practice from people that have gone through that before. So like, for example, um, we did a podcast with a manager and the, and the girl she managed, woman she managed, who had ADHD. But like just sharing best practice and like real life examples to prove like, we got the people, they're still working here at our company and they are happy and we value them. And they are, you know, it's just actually practicing what you preach. It's not mm. that difficult. But I think in the job adverts as well, a lot of it is about, um, kind of rethinking a corporate traditional way of what is professional. So mm. like I, I had some posts on LinkedIn that have gone, a lot of people have liked them, which say like, give people the interview questions in advance. <laughs> Don't ask them for meetings with no, con it's just like, for me, I'm like, this is just common sense. Mm. Um, and like, for example, the company I run ADHD Works, we recently hired some coach, we do a coaching training. So we train up a lot of coaches and then because we need, help internally <laughs> to meet the coaching demand because we're like we'll do all of it it'll be fine um we take and um, because i've now learned that you do not take and the first course i did we had 25 people and i was like we can take them all on immediately mm. it will be fine but now we put them for an interview and we take on a few of them so um and just now i basically thought like w one of them said i can have the interview questions and i was like i'm just gonna give all of them the interview like actually it will help everyone so mm. it's kind of taking a completely like 180 approach to how things should be done i often hear that example of interview questions employers say like one they said when would it be fair to give the person the interview questions in advance so that it doesn't advantage disadvantage the other people i, and I was see. like right what and they're like half an hour two hours. i was like I don't think it matters. Like when you just give them to her, like it doesn't disadvantage the other people. It's not like having the interview questions gives you some kind of magic. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like you're not hiring someone based off how they answer a question in an interview, mm. like completely unnatural process. You're hiring them based off like how well they can do the job. So enable them to show you that they can do that. Um, yeah. So I've, and, and I think something around like the same. Well, the point I was getting at was like basically. Uh, embracing squiggly careers like that was something that I really struggled with in getting a job because I didn't have a background I had like 5,000 different job work experience days but I didn't have like worked at this company for five years and you know the whole narrative of like even asking people why they've had a career gap mm. or having to stay in a job you don't like for three years because it's good for your CV but like actually embracing other ways of thinking and like particularly for these like psychometric tests and stuff like just realizing that success doesn't look just one way. Mm. I'm just thinking about burnout and that might be how it can show up in the workplace as well. Like you could get an employee who is amazing, but because they haven't taken the, as, as many breaks as they might, you know, they might have performed better if they just took a few more breaks or if they were given um, something um, so with burnout, because obviously you're doing a lot, is, have, is that something you experience and do you do anything that sort of helps you navigate yourself around it and, or to avoid it or even to manage it as you're, if, if you're going through it? Yes. Yes, I spent all weekend <laughs> writing a book. Yeah. <laughs> about to ha train 36 new coaches this week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> You've got so much going on retreat in October. Yeah. <laughs> you sound like Everyone someone who must be on the cusp of burnout. <laughs> well, I think actually right now I'm probably in a much better place than I have been previously. Although I'm doing a lot. Mm. Um, a lot of these things that we're doing, we've done them before. Like the training, the coaches. Now we've done that a few times. Like I've built the systems in the company so that it's not stressful. Mm. Um, although I can't remember the challenges, other people can. So they're like, okay, we're gonna do, we'll make these changes this time. Um, so it's just repeating them. And then for me personally with the burnout, like I think it's having coaching really helps me to be like, what am I doing and why? Um, to have someone almost help me look at my own life from their eyes um, and go through all the projects and be like, okay, what have I picked up because like, 
this current book is one because someone was like, you should do an ADHD at work. But I'd written 75% of a different book about ADHD coaching. And then they were like, an ADHD at work book would be good. And I was like, I can do it. <laughs> oh, so, but like looking at it and being like, okay, what do I actually want to do? Like regularly sort of reviewing your life and reg- like really, really planning in um, r- on rest. I'm, I hate rest personally. Um, if I had like a day to do nothing and I don't know what to do with that day. But I think it's like understanding that there are different kinds of rest because having ADHD means that we might have, we want that extra stimulation so for example, to rest, I might like get a massage or go to yoga or make sure that I see friends or um, and try to, uh, something I do a lot is actually review my week in advance with, mm. I've got a virtual assistant who none of, none of the things that I do would happen without Beth, um, nothing, not like, and access to work helped pay for Beth, who was the virtual assistant. Um, but we go through our calendar a lot and be like, okay, what don't you need to do? Like, for example, we cancel the meeting tomorrow. I'm sorry to the person we've canceled it with, but like, we're like, do you need to do that? Yeah, thank you for not canceling this. this. <laughs> like, God, this, yeah, this someone was like, oh, I've got a, they're like, I don't have any clients and I'm full stressed. And so I was like, we could do a LinkedIn live. <laughs> and I was like, I don't need to do that. <laughs> and then it's like, so like kind of doing a regular like review of my calendar of like mm. what things have I just said yes to now I'm a lot better than I was as well like a year ago I would literally spend every day in meetings of pe- like chats like networking chats of people and helping everyone that wanted to chat to me so now I'm I try to have like boundaries before even talking to people and like for me personally I find it helpful to make rules um mm. like don't have any chats um like networking type chats like set up rate like people can pay money if they want to talk to me <laughs> because otherwise i will end up doing whatever they want yeah. um, you have a tendency of uh taking on too much and saying yes to just everything and then suddenly it's like whoa it's too much I'm yeah crashing and burning now <laughs> but when you know that it's helped so uh, i also try to have like the current kind of projects written out and like on the wall mm. so i can see them that's helpful and then anything new mm. for example a few months ago i was like i want to do an adhd fashion line and the the idea was really annoying. It was like in my head a lot. But because it's not on that wall, I also have something written on my fridge, which is like, if it's not a hell yes, or something, it's a not now. So it's like, okay, that actually in coaching, we have something called river of ideas. So it's like, if you imagine that the, there's a river with each idea of the fish, um, you can only pick one out at a time to cook it. Otherwise, if you get two out, one will die. Mm-hmm. I learned this in my training for coaching. And so it's like, have them all there, write them down, put the ideas somewhere on the shelf, like write them all out and then come back to them at regular points. So like every three months, I try to like review the goals and be mm. like, okay, we've done all of these things. Next, new one, what do we want to take off? And so it's like actually building in, like knowing that you don't have to do everything right now, but putting them somewhere so you don't forget. Cause I think that's the ADHD mm. tendency. And then like regularly having these like, well, say for example, for me, I know I have to go to yoga every morning and then um, my life works a lot better. If I don't do that, that's how I can tell that like burnout is coming. Mm. There's a chapter on burnout in the book, B is for burnout. So it's like a burnout plan. <laughs> so then I'm like, okay, that means that we need to like cut down on things and like mm. get back to the basics. That's fascinating, Leanne. I could chat to you all afternoon, but unfortunately we don't. <laughs> what I do is I have three questions that the community have asked me to ask you. So I will fire away. The first one is, I feel like my ADHD traits can sometimes cause problems in my romantic relationship with my partner. Um, Does ADHD coaching, can that be beneficial in that situation? And in how would that help? Yeah. ADHD in relationships is a very painful area for everyone. It's a whole everyone. episode on its own. Yeah, whole episode, <laughs> uh, personally. <laughs> but I think in general, I think probably the biggest and like the theme of what we've been talking about is like the self-awareness. Obviously, like it's getting to understand how that shows up for that individual Mm. um, and like what the specific challenges are that they're experiencing. I would imagine stuff like it literally we can like hyper focus on a person. Mm. And so in the beginning, it might feel really intense. Our brains might literally work better because we've got more dopamine going into them. And then it just disappears. You're like, I don't like you anymore. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, I think there'll be but, a lot of people listening thinking, oh, yeah, I relate to that. Actually, I 
currently open for dating so if anyone would I was like maybe I should make an application <laughs> process because I'm not like I think like I think dating apps are really, uh, I had like a ADHD coach on my hinge at one point and then people were like can you coach me I'm like no <laughs> um, a perk of dating Leanne is you get <laughs> <laughs> very stressful probably I've just accepted that old dialogue and write books the rest of my life it's fine um but the yeah, so I think it's like that hyper focus that we might struggle to like remember the person exists. Um, in men, I've seen a, not to be sexist, but I've seen a lot of men that are kind of like they just don't think that um, they don't think about the challenges like that or like how their behavior might affect the other person. Actually, it's probably women do it, me too. Um, but it's like we do things and then we're like, oh, but why are you upset? I was just doing this thing mm. and not being aware of like the impacts that might have phone use. Probably the best advice I can give you, person, anyone that is listening to this, charge your phone outside your room if you possibly, and that's what ADHD can go chink it out with. <laughs> charge your phone outside your room, get an alarm clock. Um, but things like phone use um, are really, really tricky for ADHD -ers. Um Yeah, and I think it's, it's getting a bit of self-awareness around it and like prioritizing time with your partner um, mm. where you're actually just being with them and not having to do stuff. And reminding yourself of like why you're with them because I think it can be difficult to I, th I think keeping that novelty like doing fun stuff with them like mm. go painting or rock climbing um so that you're still getting the excitement and um remembering like that you're lucky to have each other be nice Very to helpful. your partner <laughs> <laughs> that's super helpful um and the next one actually kind of ties in and it's they've just said RSD help yes. but I can see how it can be a, one of the problematic parts of being in a romantic relationship, but also in the workplace, you know, perhaps you don't want to stick up for yourself. You don't want to ask for a raise. You don't want to say no to something because of the RSD. So I suppose in a broad umbrella, if we just put it in a box and just call it rejection sensitive dysphoria, is there any tips that you've learned to ease it, to manage it, to make it slightly more bearable when it, when it flares? I have a whole course on rejection sensitive that's where I got the back. <laughs> the Do not worry. <laughs> Someone told me RSD wasn't real for that book. That and I ended up going and complaining to the World Health Organization, being like, Well, it should be real. And I was like, You should put them in the criteria. <laughs> like, um Would it just got aside like what big question, but what where does it come from? Because it's so prominent. RSD. Yeah. A lifetime of shame and not feeling good enough. <laughs> yeah. That makes growing sense. up in a neurotypical world where everyone's like, why can't you just be normal? And you're like, I'm trying my best. It's so be intense. Like, it's like rage sometimes. It can just, you lose rationale. And I think it's that self awareness bit as well, because if very often we might be unaware of what we're feeling until later on. Um, what you mentioned earlier where you get that anxiety about the talks mm. as soon as it's booked in that's the RSD being like oh, I'm gonna fail but we might not consciously be feeling that feeling mm. we might just be beating ourselves up for it and how I like to think about rejection sensitive dysphoria um, it's like often one very little thing like publishing AHD on that book like it was not I could fix it like mm. it's fine that's not the end of the world but that still crushed me and then that one thought spirals into another thought there's um a scene in harry potter where they touch these rings and in, in some kind of bank and the coins spread to other coins yes so yeah, it's, yeah. um yeah, yeah that's how i think of it. it's like they it's like the one thought of like oh my god i missed about ahd i'm gonna get fired i'm gonna get cancelled everyone hates me why did i write a book what am i doing with my life oh my god i should just kill myself right now and i like to make it like a um tornado <laughs> so and particularly for how i describe it is like it's us invalidating ourselves mm. and being like why am i even upset about this like what's wrong with me like i can just fix it and you rationally know that you're being irrational um like I was upset. oh I did a talk for a big company in Ireland a few weeks ago and I kept mixing up Ireland and Northern Ireland and afterwards I was like I'm closing my company <laughs> I was like why am I doing that like and so it's horrible because it's like being in a battlefield with your own brain where it's like just fighting mm. back so um the best advice I've got is like realize what's happening like notice and in ADHD coaching we call that name it to tame it so it's like oh this is rejection sensitive dysphoria. It's not like I'm not just being emotional or dramatic or mm. but I'm, I'm experiencing something that other people experience with ADHD mm. and it will pass. Like, although it feels like the end of the world 
I just should watch TV show or something for a good few hours. Because the thing about RSD is that it only lasts for a short period of time. And that's why it's a condition very specific to ADHD, not something like bipolar. With very strong mood swings because RSD is always triggered by something, including mm. like our thoughts. So knowing it's going to pass eventually, it might be a few hours, it might be a day, but it's not a chemical imbalance. It's mm. like just our thoughts. It's like, um, and try not to, I guess, react when you're in that moment, because otherwise you you might say something that you regret once you've <laughs> get into a safe room yeah. and yeah. don't <laughs> take your phone or yeah. any laptop and just watch the TV. Uh, what I try to do is watch Gossip Girl, <laughs> um, but basically be able to recognize that, then take action to look mm. after yourself, be nice to yourself, um, watch TV show, whatever. and like I was almost thinking of yourself like a small toddler having a tantrum mm. and being like, "You'll calm down. Just don't let them near the knives." Like, it's okay. Um, Good analogy. Probably, no, no, dramatic analogy. <laughs> probably can't say them now. My brain's like, you're going to get cancelled. <laughs> like, well, if you just said in the last hour, little. Yeah. Um, Call me up later, Alex. Cut that bit out, please. Um, but yeah, I think that, like, just being nice to yourself, treating yourself like a small child, telling mm. the people around you if you can, like, you know, I'm having, I'm having, I just need some time to process this, um, and knowing that it will pass. I think preparing and also like like I mentioned earlier, like challenging your thoughts back, like asking yourself, is that true? Like um, almost thinking of yourself like a lawyer for the other side. If you had to prove this thought that you are the worst human being in the world, like how can anyone literally prove that? Mm. And almost intellectualizing with your thought. It's a fun life I live here. This is what I do for work every day. I'm like, pretend to be a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and also something else that really helps is like actually drawing out the worst case scenario. So getting really clear of like, okay, I'm worried about this AHD book. Like what is the worst case scenario? Because often we can stay stuck in the panic mode. Mm. But when you get to like, okay, if you, I don't even know what the worst case scenario for that. There isn't, someone would complain. I could send them another book. Like, um, and then realizing like, no matter what the worst case scenario is, like you've probably lived through much worse and you will be okay. And like, even if you lose all of your money and have to live on the street, you'll be fine. Like, mm. go and I'll have a job. <laughs> you'll, be, you'll be all right. Like, and, but it's like realizing like you can survive really hard things. And, but getting yourself out of the just general panic and mm. like the hurricane, but into the like, okay, fine. What is the worst case scenario? Yeah. Fascinating. Very helpful. Thank you so much. And, where can people find you if they want to chat to you more or buy your book? Uh, they can go to adhdworks.info and adhdworks social media. They get a mask on the internet. <laughs> uh, many different apps. They go to Amazon or Waterstones or uh, very different many experiences out Amazing. there. On the, if you Google me, you'll, you'll find me quite easily. Yeah, um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you.